Lord, we learn of those things in your word, and we turn to it again this morning. We thank you uh, in advance for the fact that you will teach us and guide us into your truth, and we ask for hearts that will be attentive and, and uh, yielding to the working of your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I read an article this last week in Relevant Magazine. It was an article entitled, Seven Things I Wish I Knew Before I Became a Christian. <laughs> Seven Things I Wish I Knew About Christianity Before Becoming a Christian. Number one was, it's really hard. Uh, it's wrong to let people think that the Christian life is going to be easy and it's going to be a life of joy and, and just one blessing after another because the reality is uh, there are demands on us in the Christian life that are just a part of uh, the journey that we're on. Second thing was it doesn't fix everything. It certainly takes care of our greatest problem, which is separation from God, brings us the gospel, but it doesn't solve all of our problems, does it? It doesn't, doesn't fix everything. We haven't been invited into a, a formula in which we just apply these uh, f formulas to our life and then everything uh, happens in such a way that we live happily ever after. Number three, you won't have all the answers. Again, you'll have answers to the, the most critical, uh, fundamental uh, issues of life, but we don't lose all uh, doubt when we come to faith in Christ. Uh, all of our philosophical uh, concerns and questions and intellectual struggles don't dissipate, do they? Number four, you never stop learning and you never stop changing. Number five, you still make mistakes. That's reassuring to know, isn't it? Number six, it's complex. This whole matter of Christianity and the history of Christianity and what people believe and why they believe it and the differing groups, they wanted to know some of those things before they became a Christian. And then the last one was, it's not us versus them. It's not us in the sense of Christians being against them. That is the unsaved of our world. Uh, we are in a battle, but it's not with flesh and blood, as Paul says in Ephesians 6. Well, as I read that article, I immediately went to what I was studying in Galatians 5 because there's some corollaries there in our lesson this morning. And in Galatians chapter 5, we're going to see this morning that apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our life, it's impossible to live the Christian life. So that was something that uh, the article mentioned, and it's, it's certainly true to what God shares with us in His Word. It's only by His grace and power that we can obey and do the will of God. So let's begin with a review quickly of this fifth chapter of Galatians because in this fifth chapter, and in fact the entire book, we've been looking at what it means to be free in Christ. What does it mean to experience true freedom in the way that God declares it to us? And Galatians does that better than any book perhaps in the New Testament. This fifth chapter especially zeroes in on this whole matter of freedom. And we have been looking at, first of all, in the first six verses, how it is that freedom was obtained and it was obtained by means of the work of Christ on our behalf. And then in verses 7 through 15, the section we just finished last week, at least the latter part of that section, we looked at how freedom is to be maintained. It's one thing to receive it, to obtain it, but the Spirit of God wants us to hold on to it. He wants us to maintain it, doesn't he? And, and we looked at the two extremes that pull us away from freedom, as God has defined it, the extreme of legalism or the extreme of license. We find people swinging back and forth like a pendulum between those two uh, extremes at times, one giving a false sense of spirituality, that I am uh, more spiritual perhaps than somebody else because I do the list of things here or I don't do the list of things over here. So legalism gives a false spirituality, whereas license gives a false liberty. God never intended that we live life in such a way that we just get to do whatever we want. <laughs> we live the way we want to. Well, that's a false freedom. That's not freedom as God defines it for us. The attitude that we noted last week that we are to embrace is an attitude that is really reflected in a heart of love and service to each other. We're not called to self-love. Uh, my understanding of Scripture is we do that very well without being commanded to do it. We do that naturally. The Bible never calls on us to love ourselves more than we already do. The Bible does call on us to love each other as much as we already love ourselves. So to that extent, we are looking at this and we're saying, I am supposed to love you and I'm supposed to care for you as much as I already love and care for myself. 
You're supposed to love and care for the person sitting beside you and behind you and in front of you as much as you already love and care for yourself. Now, when we hear that, that ought to shake us to the core, and it ought to bring to our mind a couple of questions. And and one of those questions might be, why? (laughs) Why are you telling me that i got to love the person next to me and behind me in front of me as much as I already love myself? Why are you telling me I've got to serve these other people as much as I want to be served? Well, the answer is very simple to that one because God tells us to, right? It's a command of Scripture. We're to love and serve each other in the same way that we love and serve ourselves. But the other question that seems to me that presses in on us at this point is how, how in the world do you expect me to do that? Do you know these people who are sitting around me? Yes, I do know them, and and I know them as I know myself. And we're not often easily loved, are we? We're not often easily served. And so that is a very valid question. How can I do this greatest of commands, which is to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love my neighbor as myself? How can I do that? And the answer to that question is given to us in the lesson this morning, and I think it's defined in the next point of our outline, which is understanding the role of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives. Understanding the role of the Holy Spirit. If you're in Galatians 5, follow as I read, beginning at verse 16, and we'll just look at these three verses today. As we said last week, we're kind of slowing it down just a little bit because of the impact that these verses have. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. All right, so there we have what it seems to me are a couple of things, first of all, that we need to know. He tells us in these verses a couple of things that we need to know, and one of the things that we need to know is we live in two spheres. We live in two spheres. That is, we live in the flesh. We live in this tabernacle we call our body. We live in this fallen world. That's one of the spheres that we live in. The other sphere that we live in is we're part of a new order. As a believer in Christ, as a follower of Christ, as one who has trusted Christ for our salvation, we have been brought into a whole new set of dynamics, haven't we? If anyone is in Christ, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that person is a new creation. So that tells us something about this two spheres that we live in. When when Paul writes uh, some of his letters, he identifies what that looks like. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 2, he says, to the saints who are in Corinth. Okay, so they're saints, they're in this new spiritual relationship, but they're living in Corinth. He does the same thing in Philippians when he writes to the believers at Philippi. He identifies them as being in two different spheres, a physical sphere a sphere in which we are connected to the first Adam by means of humanity, and we're connected to the last Adam by means of faith and trust in Christ. The second thing I think we need to know as we come to these verses is that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is crucial for spiritual growth, all right? You look at that blank, and you can pick any synonym you want to put in that blank, any synonym of the word critical, crucial, central, foundational, Uh, all of those words, vital, whatever word communicates to you what is absolutely fundamentally essential to grow spiritually, that is the role that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. So when we look at these verses, we are going to see that the key to living the Christian life The key to growing spiritually is found in our relationship to the Holy Spirit of God. The third member of the Godhead. So God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. The third member of the Godhead, God the Holy Spirit, is critical, vital, essential, fundamental. The key to growing spiritually. Now the tragedy is, 
that in many fundamental Bible-believing churches such as ours, the tragedy is that the Holy Spirit has been viewed incorrectly in so many ways as somehow not being this third member of the Godhead that the Scripture totally describes him to be. That, you know, it's something nebulous, it's some force, it's some power, it's something to be a little bit frightened about, something that we withdraw from. And how tragic could that be? When the doctrine of the Holy Spirit tells us that the way to grow spiritually is in our relationship to him. He is the other comforter that Jesus said he would send when he was leaving this earth and going to the Father, he said, I will send you another comforter, another one who is like me, is what he meant. So the Spirit of Christ dwells in us in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And that same person is the one who is critically and essentially connected to our spiritual growth. That's why we're not surprised when we're looking at this section in Galatians in chapter 5 and chapter 6, that Paul will mention six times the Holy Spirit of God. Six times he wants us to see this. So let's look then, secondly, at what I need to do. All right, that's what I need to know. I need to know that I live in two spheres. I'm connected in my humanity to the first Adam. I'm connected to the last Adam by means of faith in Christ. Having received that Holy Spirit of God, I understand that my relationship to the Holy Spirit is now critical to my ability to do what he just said I'm supposed to do, and that is to love and serve you just as you are to love and serve me and each other. So what do we need to do? Paul puts forward in these three verses four different things that he wants us to do. Now, I'm not suggesting that these are, you know, the list that you check off, and if you do these four things, then you, you, you're fulfilling all the... God wants for you in regard to your relationship to the Holy Spirit or to grow spiritually. But they're, they're obviously important. The first one, at the beginning of verse 16, is obey the command. Very simple, right? Obey the command. Verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit. And we're going to take this slow in terms of looking at these phrases because they're all packed with things that we need to know. And, and the very first thing he does is he introduces a new thought of this subject by saying, but I say. That's Paul's way of introducing a new thought to what he's already been talking about. So as he has been talking about this subject of these two extremes that people find themselves going to, right? They find themselves either yielding to legalism, which gives them a false sense of spirituality, or they find themselves yielding to license, which gives them a false sense of freedom. And, and so Paul says, but this is what I want you to hear. You, you're hearing other things that I don't think are accurate, that I don't think are right on, I don't think are biblical, but I want you to hear this. And so in contrast to the misinformation, Paul throws in that little opening statement of verse 16 to say, okay, here's a new thought, but I say. And what does he say? In four words, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Now, let's break that statement down even a little bit more. And let's look, first of all, at the word itself in which he says that we're supposed to walk. In the book of Galatians, there are three different words for walk. It's not important that we get into the intricacies of each of those words, but this particular word is significant because this particular word is the word peripateo. Peripateo. You've heard of peripatetic. Peripatetic. If you have a peripatetic teacher, Aristotle evidently was a peripatetic teacher, and he would walk about while he taught. We see peripatetic preachers on TV. They walk all over the place, right? They're not intending necessarily to be peripatetic. That's just what they do. But here it is saying this idea of peripatetic is to walk about. It means to go from one place to another. And, and so that's what he's saying to us here. It brings to mind movement, doesn't it? We're, we're to walk in the Spirit. We're to move with the Holy Spirit. So as the Holy Spirit moves, we're to move as well from one place to the other. Perhaps more important than the, the idea of this word is the concept of walk in Scripture. Because when you look at the word walk in Scripture, it's, a, it's a, an amazing metaphor for life itself. So when he says walk by the Spirit... 
It speaks of how it is that we're to live our life. He's talking about how it is that we conduct ourselves day to day. He's talking about the very lifestyle that we choose to live out our life. And he's connecting that walk and that lifestyle and that behavior to the Holy Spirit. So that our lifestyle, our behavior, our conduct is in fact to be in keeping with, in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Some people, maybe all of us do, but some people more than others have a distinctive walk, don't they? I know people who, before I can see physically exactly that it's them, maybe it's dark or the, I, I can't see, I can tell by their walk who they are, right? You know that as you watch somebody walk that you know really well, you can say, oh, yeah, there, I, there he comes. I know him. I know that walk. That's the idea of what he's saying here. We're to walk in such a way that people would see us and see by the way we walk that we're walking in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's powerful. That's significant to be able to look at the way we walk, conduct ourselves, our lifestyle, and say that person is a follower of Christ because I see in their walk a reflection of the Holy Spirit of God. I love the statement in Genesis chapter 5. It's talking about Enoch. And it talks about the fact that Enoch, what? Walked with God. You know, if you had to capture the essence of your spiritual life, if you had to capture the essence of what you would want to have said about you, can, can you think of anything that you would want to be said about you more than that little tiny statement? They walked with God. Enoch walked with God just really communicates something very powerful, doesn't it? It communicates that, that Enoch was in harmony with God, that Enoch's life, his lifestyle, his conduct, his behavior was reflective of the God that he worshiped and served. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, can two walk together unless they are in harmony? Can two walk together unless they're in harmony? Well, they can. <laughs> it's not a lot of fun, is it? But, but the point is, can two people really walk in the sense of fellowship, in the sense of intimacy? Bonnie and I walk every morning that we can. We don't walk on Sunday morning, but we try to walk every other morning. We get up early and we go for a walk. And those walks have, have been obviously physically uh, helpful, beneficial, but, it, but they've, they've grown to be much more than that. They're times of fellowship together. There are times in, in which we're praying for our children and our grandchildren and our church and for you that that walk has become a way of our connecting our souls together. And so when we say, do you want to go for a walk? We don't mean we're just going to walk a few miles. We mean we're going to go and we're going to walk together in harmony. Now, I have to be honest, since Bonnie's not here this morning, I can share this. There have been times where we haven't been in harmony and we go for a walk it really isn't that much fun, really. I mean, there, there's just something, there's something, then it's all just physical, you know, exercise, but there's no soul connection. Well, that, he's, that's what he's saying here. We're to walk with God in the sense that there's a soul connection with the Spirit of God. That's what the psalmist says in Psalm 1, happy is the man, happy is the woman, happy is the teenager, happy is the child who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He says in Psalm 26 and verse 11, for I will walk in integrity before you. See, all of those metaphors are a part of this. You really want to see this word come alive, just go over to Paul's letter in Ephesians. And in Ephesians 4, he, it just walk, walk, walk. Don't walk like the world. Don't walk that way. Walk in the light. What, John does the same thing in 1 John. Walk in the light. Walk in truth. Walk in fellowship. Don't walk in darkness. So what I want you to see is to walk communicates a picture that we can grab a hold of and we can see what he's saying here. There has to be effort. There's progress that is in view. There's advancement, isn't there? We haven't arrived. There's always another step to take when you're on a walk. Choices are made as that walk unfolds. So we have this word and we have this concept. Now, I want you to see something more. I want you to see the specifics of how he has put this together. 
Because what we have in Galatians 5 and verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit. When we zero in on that word walk, we realize that it is called an imperative, which means it's a command. So that this isn't a suggestion. This isn't something that we do. To, in fact, not do this is to disobey. To walk by the Spirit is a command. If we're not walking by the Spirit, we're disobeying. We have to be in harmony with God. We have to walk in harmony with His Spirit. We're listening to His Spirit. We're obeying His Spirit. If we don't, we disobey, and disobedience is sin. So we want to put that right out there and say, this is a command. This is the will of God for your life. Walk by the Spirit. Secondly, it's in the present tense, which tells us that this is something continuous. This is moment by moment. This is not something that you decided 10 years ago that you're going to walk by the Spirit, and, well, you've been doing it ever since. No, you haven't. If you have, it's because you are intentionally, purposefully, daily, moment by moment, walking in obedience. This is a present tense command, which means every day, 24-7, every moment that you're alive, that you're awake, you're supposed to be walking by the Spirit. Thirdly, it's in what's called the active voice, which, again, calls for action. This isn't something passive. I have a responsibility. I'm to obey this command. I'm to walk in fellowship in harmony with God's Spirit. This is not let go and let God. This isn't lay back in your easy chair and God's going to zap you with progress in your spiritual life. He doesn't do that. He makes demands of us, if you will, by way of commands and says, do this. This is God's will. And then it's a second person plural, which means it's for everybody here. It's directed to every believer. It's not for a few people. It's certainly not just for a pastor or an elder or a deacon. It's not for a Bible study teacher. It's for everybody. He includes everybody in this command. So walk by the Spirit. That's the first thing. The command is if you want to grow, if you want to advance, if you want to discover how it is that God expects you to love and serve each other, The only way that you can do that, Paul links it immediately to this command, and he says the only way you can do that is if you're walking by the Spirit. Second thing is he wants you to believe a promise that he gives with this command. And that promise is the next section of this verse. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So why is it so important that we walk by the Spirit? Well, the promise that he gives in this 16th verse is connected with the command. And if you obey the command, then you're going to receive the promise. If you don't obey the command, you're not going to get the promise. That's the way God works. So here is a command and here's a promise. The promise is, and the reason it's so important that we walk by the Spirit You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now, Lord willing, next Sunday, we're going to look at verses 19, 20, and 21. And it's not a very pretty picture of the flesh. And yet, when we look at those verses, we often see ourselves described. And why would that be? Because we're not walking by the Spirit. Because if you're walking by the Spirit, it's an emphatic double negative, (laughs) by the way, when you look at that. It's an emphatic double negative. It's ume, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That is to say, you will by no means do this. He pours on another negative, and he wants us to see how emphatic this is, and the promise is that you will overcome the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will overcome the flesh. Now, we defined the flesh last week as our sinful desires, as these old habits that don't want to let go. Paul speaks of it uh, over in the book of Romans, and he says in in, uh, Romans chapter 8, listen to this description of verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for uh, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You know what the flesh is? The flesh fundamentally, by definition, is anything that is in opposition to God in my life. That's what the flesh is. The flesh is opposed to God. The basic mark of the flesh is that it does not want to be submissive to God, does not want to be submissive to God's Word. The mark of the flesh is that it does not want to yield its authority to God. The mark of the flesh is it does not want to walk by faith. 
The mark of the flesh is it wants what it wants. It does not want to rely on God's mercy. It does not want to love and serve each other. It wants to, in fact, be served, and it wants to look out for itself first and foremost. That's why Paul says, in order to love and serve each other, you first of all have to obey this command. You have to walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit. And as you walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit, God's promise to us is you will not fulfill those lusts of the flesh, those selfish desires. Your life is going to experience a transformation. It's going to look different. As people look at your walk with God, they're going to say, there is somebody who is walking in harmony with the ways of God. There's somebody whose life to the extent that they can, to the best of their ability, they are daily walking in harmony with God's Word and with God's truth. Now, as you look on into the 17th verse, we realize thirdly that there is a struggle. We have a command, we have a promise, not surprisingly, we have a struggle. Recognize the struggle, verse 17, in which he says, "...for the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit." And the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. So we have two very different walks described for us here. And they are mutually exclusive. They're mutually exclusive. One is God's way, the spirit's way. By the spirit, the other is the flesh. The other is self, self-centered, selfish, my way. And what he wants us to know is, as we move to love each other, as we move to serve each other, there's going to be resistance. There's going to be a conflict. The flesh is going to rise up and say, no way. I don't want to serve that person. I don't want to love that person. They're not lovely. They're not worthy of my service. I'll pick and I'll I'll decide who gets that, right? So he describes for us a conflict here. And just like that person in that article said, you know, here's something I wish I had known before I became, this is one of the things. There's a conflict. And we we don't need to be surprised that there's a conflict. In fact, we on one level need to be glad there is one, as we'll see in a moment. But the first thing he says in the 17th verse is there's an irreconcilable antagonism between the flesh and the spirit. And you need to underscore that. It's an irreconcilable antagonism. They are in opposition to each other, is the way he words it. There's no truce. There's no ceasefire. There's no peace treaty. There's no peaceful coexistence between your flesh and between the Spirit of God. And the fact that this battle is going on inside of you is not all bad. In fact, it's good. We don't want to be at peace with sin. We don't want to be at peace with selfishness. We don't want to be at peace with living life my way rather than God's way. There should be a conflict by definition. We now have the Holy Spirit living within us, and there's a battle that's going on. The Spirit of God saying, walk in this way, and the flesh is saying, I don't want to walk in that way. I want to walk my way. And so we have a conflict, don't we? You won't be at peace with this selfish desire if you're walking by God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to give you this new outlook on life. End of verse 17, you notice that in our own strength there's certain defeat. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Remember we have said on more than one occasion that the book of Galatians is a kind of a short version of the book of Romans. And the more I've studied Galatians, the more I've seen how true that is because when you go back to the book of Romans and you go to the seventh chapter, what is it that the apostle Paul describes in that seventh chapter but this very thing that he introduces in Galatians 5 of this battle between the flesh and the spirit. In fact, this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, for that which I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. Does anybody relate to that? Don't you, well, you can, you, no, don't, you don't have to show your hand because I think it's all of us, right? Raise your hand if you do not understand verse 15 because you don't have a conflict. But 
If I do the very thing that I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Now this is Paul writing the book of Romans well into his spiritual journey. He's the greatest missionary other than Jesus Christ, probably the the, the greatest of all saints that God is allowed to have us get a glimpse of in the way that he has. The writer of a huge part of the New Testament, what does he say to us? I've got this incredible battle going on inside my life every day. I know the good that I'm supposed to do, but I can't quite do it. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I do it. I know I'm supposed to do that, but I don't do it. And that's the struggle that he's talking about here. If you yield to your flesh, guess what? You're going to end up in verse 19, 20, and 21 every day of Galatians 5. If that's the testimony of Paul, then how much more of us? What are we supposed to do? The answer is not legalism and find a list of things that we think if we do these things and everybody sees us do them, that we're spiritual. That's false spirituality because God's interested in transforming us from the inside out, as we just sang. And it can't be license because just living the way I want to is just another form of living to the flesh. So the answer is in verse 18. Look at verse 18. Follow, he says, the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now remember the context of what we're looking at in, Romans, uh, in Galatians 5. But if you are led by the Spirit. So here the leading of the Spirit. What we understand in verse 18 when he says that we are to be led by the Spirit, this is not talking about guidance for the future. He's not saying you need to be led by the Spirit so that you know who to marry, what job to take, where to live. and it, that's, God will direct you in those things. He will give us wisdom for those decisions. That's not what he's talking about in verse 18. He's not saying if you're led by the Spirit in the form of guidance with regard to the future that is unknown. He's talking about God's Spirit directing us into what we know. Do you know the right thing to do? Most of the time we do, don't we? Do you know the wrong thing to avoid? Most of the time we do. We live this. I'll share a personal testimony again because Bonnie's not here. I went home one day this week. I've been studying Galatians 5, right? I've been studying what it means to walk by the Spirit. And that's always an uncomfortable thing when when you're dealing with passages like this and the flesh raises up its head, right? It's bad enough, but when you're supposed to be learning and then teaching and communicating this truth to other people, you're supposed to, first of all, apply it and live it in your own life, right? So I go home. And, I, you know, as it so often happens, I, I, I'm home and um, unwinding a little bit, and as I come in, there's something that Bonnie needs from the store. And in my mind, it's like, honey, if you could have only told me that when I was leaving the office, I could have just slipped right by and gotten that for you, and my flesh wouldn't rise up right now and say <laughs> things that it shouldn't say, Right? And, I mean, I've just gone on that grueling three-mile drive down Sarah Road, fighting that traffic all the way home, all three stoplights. There was at least one car, and now I've got to get back out and do it again. And I'm rehearsing this in my mind. I'm not saying anything to her. She probably, after all these years, she can read me like a book, so she knows where my spirit is going in this unspoken conversation. But I'm battling in my mind all kinds of selfish thoughts and I'm trying to think in terms of what is this saying to me right now I knew the right thing to do I I didn't I don't need the guidance of the Holy Spirit at that point to tell me am I supposed to be selfish now and say something really rude and unkind to my wife or am I supposed to lovingly say okay honey I'll go get that for you Because I know what you've been doing all day is is not easy either. You see, so when he says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, it's not not mystery, all right? 
we know the right thing to do. We have to walk in harmony with God's Spirit and obey what he said in verse 16. It is to be under the continuous influence of the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus said in John 15, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. There's all kinds of snapshots that the Scriptures give us to say the same things to us, to communicate what it is. The Holy Spirit, in other words, is leading. The question is, are we following? He's showing us where to go. I can assure you, the Holy Spirit was shouting in my head by means of a megaphone what it was I needed to do and how I needed to do it. And so what did I have to do at that point? I had a choice. I either yield to the flesh and express the flesh in frustration and anger, or I yield to God's Spirit and say, that's the right thing to do. Carlin, keep your mouth shut, get in your car, and with a smile, go and get what's needed. I won't tell you how that turned out. <laughs> and do not ask Bonnie how that. <laughs> the Spirit provides all we need. You see the next part of verse 18? But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, when I read that, when I first read that, I think, wait, why did he say it that way? But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why, why did he refer to the law? Why, why does he bring the law back in here? What I would have thought he would have said is, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the flesh. But he doesn't. He says, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Why does he say it that way? Well, in effect, he's saying almost the same thing. They're almost synonyms at this point. Because Paul, all the way through Galatians, has said the law and grace don't mix, right? Th those two things are, are, are not compatible. The law appeals to our flesh. The law says you can, you know, do this on your own. The Holy Spirit says, see, you can't do that on your own. And so, in effect, he's saying the same thing. He's saying the enabling work of God's Spirit is what we need. It's all we need. When we follow the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we listen to the Spirit, we obey the Spirit, and that's all we need, and we're filled up with the fullness of God, and the fullness of God within us then pours out of our life in service and love to others, and that's what this whole passage is developing. And so, apart from the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to live the Christian life. So if you and I are not communicating, if we're not listening, if we're not in contact with, if we're not in harmony with, if we're not sensitive to, if we're not under the influence of the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're not growing in your walk with God. You might be doing a whole bunch of stuff, but you're not growing the way God wants you to grow. It's only by His grace and power applied in our lives by His Spirit that we are able to do and accomplish the will of God. So what do we take away? It's very simple. We look at this, and we realize we can't live for a moment. We can't live for a moment in our own strength. We need daily, in fact, we need moment by moment dependency on the Spirit of God and the grace of God. That is what he is saying. Again, I don't think this is a checklist. There, you know, you can, you, can, you can buy a book, Seven Steps to Walking in the Spirit, Eight Steps to Walking in the Spirit, Five things to walk in the Spirit. Are, are there things we... Of course there are. But, it, but we don't walk around with a list and says, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. What, what does it look like? It looks like a heart that is humble before God is what it looks like. It looks like a heart that is humble before God, that is dependent on God. God makes it abundantly clear that he resists the proud, but he constantly gives grace to the humble. And there's nothing more unattractive than a self-righteous believer. There's nothing more unattractive than a Christian who's bound up in legalism and thinks that by doing these things, they're somehow better than everybody else, or they're somehow earning favor with God. No, there is essentially a heart that is humble before God that says, God, I can't love these people in my life the way you commanded me to. I can't serve these people the way that you call for me to apart from your enablement. You've told me what to do. Now give me the humility of heart to trust you, to rest in you, to believe you. Stay. How, how do you know these things? you got to be in here too. A lot of us don't know a whole lot about the Holy Spirit because, frankly, we don't know a whole lot about this book. 
There's no way as a child of God you can know what it means to walk with God if you don't know what he has said to you in his word about how it is that you're supposed to walk with God. Enoch knew how to walk with God. The psalmist in Psalm 1 knew what it meant to walk with God because their heart was humble before God and they were no doubt exposing that heart to the truth of God's word every way and in every chance that they had. Paul says in in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. So you're going through the day and you're constantly praying, God, help me, God, help me. God, I need your help. I, I, I need to stay in touch with you. I need to walk with you. It's just a matter of fellowship, isn't it? When you fall, you, you get up and you move on. When you fall, you confess your sin and you move on. So it's these truths that God gives us in his word that define what this looks like. How is it that we walk with God? We walk with God by staying in harmony with the truth of God as he's revealed that in his word and by staying sensitive to the voice of God's spirit that, I don't know, he he can't shout most things to us any louder than he does when we're sitting there and making choices, right? There's some of you that know every time that you go into that room where that computer is, you know before you ever go in there what's going to happen. And the Holy Spirit of God's probably saying to you all the way in there, don't go in there, don't go in there, there's nobody else home, don't go in there, you're going to look at stuff you shouldn't. What is it? He's, he's you walk by the Spirit. Stop. You have a choice. Don't walk that way. Walk that way. You know that there are things that trigger frustration and anger. It's a choice. Step back from those. Ask God to help me not to do that. You know when you become envious and jealous and resentful towards somebody else. Avoid things that trigger. That, that, that's what he's saying to us here. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We get to end this morning around this table. This table is a reminder to us of how all of this is possible. This table is a reminder to us of the cross. It's a reminder to us of the gospel. This table is a reminder of how it is that we got into God's family to begin with. And we get into God's family by what he has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you know Jesus as your personal Savior, you're walking with God as best you can, you're walking in harmony with him, then God says, come to these elements, this bread and this cup, and receive them as reminders that every day is a new beginning with God. He affords us that privilege by his grace and that mercy because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. If you've never put your trust in Christ as your Savior, we would love for you to consider that very truth right now, that that your sin has been paid for, that that sense of separation that you've sensed between you and God, your self-efforts that seem to never be fulfilling, they're not supposed to be, because it's only the gospel that gives eternal life. It's only the gospel that affords us the opportunity to be in a relationship with God, to have his spirit living and dwelling within us. So we extend to you the invitation of the gospel, which is the good news, which we receive simply by believing in what Jesus did, not anything that we have done. Let me pray for us, and we will receive the elements this morning. Gracious Father, we're so very thankful for the greatness of your love, for the greatness of your grace, for your mercies which are new to us every day as we've already recounted, Father. Lord, thank you for the the simplicity, the truthfulness, the, the power of these words to us this morning to call us to walk in a way that is honoring to you, pleasing to you. Father, if we could ask anything for this church fellowship, it would be that as a body of believers, We would be known as people who walk with God, who walk with God in the way they conduct their business, who walk with God in the way that they they treat each other within their families, within their marriage, the way they relate to each other in this body. Father, the way in which we pursue and, and follow after you, the way we worship you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord, those are the characteristics that we would call for and ask for. We thank you for 
the privilege, again, of being reminded as we come to these elements, the bread and the cup, of what it is that you have done. And we receive them with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.